a lot of these lines on maps, which we kind of allow to shape our conception of the world, are basically, you know, they're all made up. They're all, they were invented by somebody at some point. And, you know, you can imagine parallel timelines in which the lines went somewhere else, you know? Hello and welcome to the pod. Today we're looking at borders, boundaries and maps. And my guest, John Elledge, joins to discuss the big ones. The Mason-Dixon line, dividing north and south in the US. The partitions of Ireland and India. Israel and Palestine. And perhaps most controversial of all, Middlesex. Plenty more great history is on the way, including the ancient Greeks, why we go to war, Valkyrie, the Tom Cruise movie on the 1944 plot to kill Hitler, and much, much more. If you can give me a gentle, soothing rating on Spotify or Apple, I'd be hugely grateful. And I do want to give a shout out to those who've done so already. Thank you. You're in my heart. But until then, I'll hand you over to me and John Elledge discussing borders, boundaries and maps. John, welcome back to the pod. Great pleasure to have you back on. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's nice to speak to you again. Well, for the benefit of listeners, we're going to try and bumble along here because we can't see each other. And, <laughs> and so you're probably going to look horrified as we, as we chat about your new book, A History of the World in 47 Borders, the stories behind the lines on our maps. Um, and John, yes, when indeed. I... Yes. And John, when we last spoke, that was for Conspiracy, which you co-wrote with, I think, Tom Phillips? Yes, yes, with my great friend Tom, who's a, a lovely, lovely man. I had to do this one without him. Well, yes, you can't use his absence as a reason not to talk about things in this book. So I thought... <laughs> no, not at all. I thought we could start with, like, quite early on in the book, there's a big, big uh, sort of map boundary. It has always interested me because it's so weird and, and it derives from ancient Greece, which makes me happy, having studied ancient history. And it's the border between Europe and Asia, which is sort of rather arbitrary, I suppose, in certain parts. It's incredibly arbitrary. Um, I yeah, it's I, I sort of find it. I've always found that one fascinating because it's it's entirely made up, isn't it? If you look at a map of the world, okay, like you know, North and South America are a single land mass. And Africa is the same landmass as Asia and Europe. But you know, there is at least kind of an, an, an isthmus between them. There is a point where like, you can see sort of two landmasses meeting. Uh, whereas Europe and Asia are clearly just the same bloody thing. It's entirely kind of culturally constructed. Um, and it all makes a lot more sense when you kind of realise it is the ancient Greek conception of the world. Like if you kind of imagine, if you're in the Aegean, in sort of the 6th century BC, and you don't really know what's out there. You just know where the land masses are in relation to you. Then as far as you're concerned, there are there is basically land in three directions, um, and you might as well consider those to be separate things. And it kind of all, and it just sticks because of everything that happens later with, uh, with you know, the, the church and the rise of Islam and so on. And then and then European powers uh, going out and, and, and colonising the rest of the world. But it's like there is absolutely no sort of non-socially constructed reason to kind of imagine Europe and Asia to be two things at all. Like Europe is basically just the Western end of Asia, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But actually, it's why I because it's sort of an ancient Greek view and we, we're so far disconnected from, you know, particularly classical Athens, fifth century. And, and this is a, a boundary that I, I like. I'm happy with. You're comfortable with this one, then. <laughs> I am. I am. I am, because we're living in an ancient Greek world in that regard. Well, one of the things I found funny about researching that chapter is that um, even, I think it was Herodotus, you know, the father of history himself, even he in the 5th century BC was going, I don't really understand why we've got this system of continents. It doesn't make any sense to me, but someone came up with it. So, like, even by the time you get to classical Athens, People are already looking at it and going, well, this is a bit bloody stupid. But, you know, as, as history has gone on and, and the Mediterranean world came to realise that once you get beyond the Black Sea, 
there is no fundamental division between Europe and Asia. They are the same thing. It it just looks particularly absurd, I think. But I, I it's it's kind of a different sort of border than than many other ones in the book that are kind of more sort of uh, more objectively political borders. But I wanted to include it largely to kind of show to to really highlight the extent to which like a lot of these maps a lot of these lines on maps which we kind of allow to shape our conception of the world are basically you know they're all made up they're all they were invented by somebody at some point and you know you can imagine parallel timelines in which the lines went somewhere else you know and i i guess this sort of leads me on to something actually i probably uh, wanted to mention at the beginning but um because your interest in this you've written about or particularly tube maps and you did a really good podcast for the New Statesman. Um, was it Metro? Uh, Skylines, it was called. Skylines. I loved it. I loved yeah. it. It stopped a few oh, years thank ago. thank you. It did. No, it, I, yeah, no, it was, it was kind of a spin-off from, from a spin-off. So the New Statesman had a website called City Metric, which was about um, urbanism, transport, maps, and all that jazz, which, which I created and edited for, for six years uh, and then when when I left the company and they relaunched City Metric, um, uh, the podcast went with me. So, but we did about 150 episodes over over four years, so it did all right. Yeah, because on I, I remember, I mean, it had a really good intro as well, and the um, it mind the gap was on on there. It was all sort of about was it mainly London transport? You had some map men on there who I who have a very good YouTube show. But was this where you kind of have you always been interested in maps? And so the book has come out of that. Um, yes, kind of. So there's a number of different ways of kind of telling the origin story. The kind of like you know the chronologically first one was that in 1993 the BBC showed a documentary series called Tales from the Map Room, which I rewatched a couple of years ago during the pandemic. Uh, and my grandfather recorded it for me and I used to watch it over and over again. It was just one of those things, you know how you get really obsessed with things when you're a kid. And, and like there's a number, and there's loads of great stories about how, um, how, how maps have kind of shaped our sense of reality. Like the first episode is called A Tissue of Lies. And it's about how many inaccuracies there are on on that we take for granted on maps of the world, like you know the the fact that you know the the Mercator projection shows Greenland as bigger than Africa and all that kind of stuff. So a number of the stories that ended up in the book came from there. It was stuff I've been interested in for thirty years. There was also um, uh, on on when I was running City Metric, I used to do a semi regular feature called border, uh, boundary issues which was literally just kind of like, well, this is a stupid line on a map, isn't it? How did that happen? And the idea of turning it into a book kind of span out of that. But I was, I was to some extent, just kind of looking for a topic where I could do lots of different things. Like I'm not, I'm, I'm not a historian, I'm a nerd, but I am, history is one of the things I'm nerdy about. And I wanted to kind of write a book with, with lots of history in it, but also um, these kind of, sort of geographical or kind of cartographic stories that I've always been into. Uh, and also, I like stories about people being idiots, and and a book of stories about lines on maps seem to be a good way of kind of bringing those things together. Well, I was going to ask about this, so I'm I'm kind of jumbling up what I was going to talk about or ask you about, and so you've mentioned Mercator, which we'll get on to, and but you mentioned people being idiots, and as I was reading through the book, I realised particularly, I, I guess, around Sykes Pico. Do you think it's a particularly male cartography is a particularly particularly male pursuit? So I've always assumed as much. Yeah, like it did. Like the the, the sort of the, the the audience I kind of built up writing about this stuff over the last decade does feel you know far from exclusively, but I would say predominantly male, sort of seventy thirty. And like you know, it's it does seem to be quite a male impulse to kind of codify the world like that. And to kind of simplify the complexities of reality into something you can kind of see uh, at a glance. But I'm going to caveat that because once I, I tweeted this thesis and I got a lo- whole load of, uh, <laughs> of crap from, from the, 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 the writer and feminist campaigner, Caroline Criado Perez, uh, 
who who very strongly disagreed with me on that front and spent about a year after that repeatedly sending me stories of, of you know, important women from the history of cartography or, you know, women who were particularly interested in maps. So so I, sh I should at least acknowledge that that's maybe, maybe not true. But my starting assumption is that there's, there's, there's a certain amount of truth to it. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I think I guess why I asked that was because it seems like there's sort of, I don't know, maybe I'm misgeneralizing and being a terrible misogynist, but men drawing lines on maps in, in not a particularly empathetic way. Whereas one imagines when a, a woman is doing that, she's going to be a little bit more empathetic about the people that are going to be impacted by it. I, I'm not sure I go quite that far. <laughs> in that. I mean, so much... You've also got to remember that, you know, the history of diplomacy is a history of men. Like, it's it's relatively recently there have been uh, significant numbers of, 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 of women kind of around the table for these things. So, like, so many of the stories in the book are, are ones that are dominated by men. But that's because, you know, history was to a large extent. Uh, and also, I think you can it, you don't have to go looking that far for for female political leaders who've, who've maybe shown a striking lack of empathy, even in, even in, for example, recent British history. So, so I'm not, I'm not sure I'd kind of go quite that far, but I do, I, I do sort of feel like the people who get really into maps do feel slightly more likely to be men than women. Yes. Well, speaking of men and maps, and you've mentioned Makata, so let's talk about Jared Makata. So th these maps are there. I mean, they're actually quite beautiful to look at in particular, I mean, you deal with Ireland, I think, mm. the Mercator map of Ireland, which is, uh, it's a sort of a fantastical Ireland. Yes. So, so like, I, I got quite a long way through writing the book before my my editor very gently said to me, you do realise you, you are going to have to do Ireland and you are going to have to do Israel. You can't just kind of leave them out and hope we're not going to notice. Yes, we'll um, get to so Israel. These were, yeah. Yes. Oh, good. Well, there's something to look forward to. But yes, these were among the last, the last chapters I did. And I kind of wanted a way of approaching the history of, of the borders in and around Ireland that were a little bit... I wanted a way of kind of condensing basically 800 years of... Of atrocities into into a relatively small number of pages, and so for there's two island chapters. One of them I kind of look at what are known as down survey maps of Ireland, which uh, are the very first maps, properly sort of like surveyed colonial maps of an entire territory. So like you know, in the the Makata map you mentioned comes from the early 16th century, I think, and there's. And there's kind of quite a, you know, they're, they're things of beauty, but like you look at the map of Ireland and it is basically here be dragons, you know, it's like that kind of high fantasy style map. Uh, and then the down survey maps happen about a century later. And it's much more like, you know, it's like the Ordnance Survey today. It is like a properly detailed, accurate map of a country. And that came into existence, that, that entire kind of great leap forward in cartography happened because an imperialist power wanted to know what it had conquered and how to divide that land up amongst its own people. And so I just kind of found that like slightly, you know, as, as, as a map fan of many years standing, it was slightly horrific to realise the extent to which like modern cartography is basically a subset of imperialism. Like it does come out of the imperial interest. Yes, absolutely. I, I mean, that Ireland is the perfect transition that between this sort of Makata onto the onto the down survey map is the transition isn't it it's it's it mm. it's extraordinary actually it reminded me and i was while well, i was reading that particular part of the chapter of a brian friel play called translations i'm not sure if you're familiar with it which is you know i'm not sure i am but uh, i think i might have a copy somewhere <laughs> it's a wonderful no, tell, tell me your translations it's a wonderful wonderful play with lots of humor and it's Basically, British officers from the Royal Geographical Survey appear in rural Ireland and there is a, um, whilst they're sort of fiddling around with their maps they're, and they're renaming, they're all, they're renaming towns into an anglicised version. And meanwhile, there is a school where the, you have the teacher, he's teaching in, in, in Gaelic and, and in Latin. 
and it's wonderfully lyrical play. And I'm rabbiting on, so tell me to shut up. The no, this sounds like a play I should really know. It, it is what it actually was on at the National Theatre about two years ago. It was really good. And where am I? So when the uh, when he does converse with these, when the teacher of this, I think they were called hedge schools. So they were at, they was they were schools that would take place out in the open, and when he um, bumps into the geographers, he converses with them in Latin. And he doesn't like to speak English because it's such an ugly language. And it's just a quite, it's, it is a lovely, lovely play with loads of humour, but it does show that kind of clash of, of uh, you know, modernity and colonialism. I mean, like to a large, this is something that comes up again and again in the book, the extent to which it's, it is much more a book about uh, imperialism and colonialism than, than I perhaps realized it was going to be going into it like i thought it'd be like more of a sort of like hey this is a funny line on a map kind of story and I, and you just kind of like end and spending hundreds of pages working through the history of european imperialism yes well i was because i was i was looking through i've been dipping into it i have to confess not reading it from cover to cover so i hope you can forgive me but, oh no of course it's that kind of book yes yeah it is it's really lovely and just so for the listeners benefit it's sort of very short chapters that are just overflowing with information. They're, they're very enjoyable to read. And I wondered actually, and perhaps you've done this, so I haven't got to it, is if you look at the sort of developing United States of America after independence and the expansion of the, I guess, the Western border, and how, I wonder, was that mapped? or they, I mean, it kept on heading further west, didn't it? No, so like actually... Um... It's one of the original uh, essays on City Metric, which kind of inspired the book, was about a thing called the Northwest Angle, which is a part of Minnesota across an inland lake from the rest of the United States. So if you just kind of look at the landform, you would imagine it would be part of Canada, but it ends up part of the United States because the boundary was defined by the Treaty of Paris of 1783, which uh, which, which drew an end to the, the, the War of Independence, the Revolutionary Wars. And Britain and the newborn United States kind of agreed where the line between um, the US and British North America would run through the wilderness, which nobody had surveyed. So there is some language in there about how um, the line will run west from the northwesternmost point of the Lake of the Woods to the Mississippi. And there are a couple of problems with that, one of which is nobody knew what shape the Lake of the Woods was. So there was some argument over where the sort of northwesternmost point of it was. The other was that the, the Mississippi doesn't go that far north. And the people who made up this treaty didn't know this. So they ended up like, the, if you were a literal reading of the treaty, like the line, would, the boundary would just come kind of round and round the planet for the rest of time. So they had to kind of rewrite the language. And in doing so, they ended up cutting off this, this part of this territory that logically should be part of Canada and giving it to Minnesota, where it remains to this day. There's about 120 people in, in the town. Uh, and every time they, they want to leave the town, they basically have to go through Canada. And like, there's a few oddities like that on the, on the US northern border, just because nobody had done the survey before they'd find it. Yeah, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Well, I guess we're in America and we're talking about America. And one line on a map that I absolutely find fascinating is the Mason-Dixon line, which you write about. Yeah. Now, the, the reason why I, I'm, I guess, obsessed, well, no, obsession is not the right word. I'm so interested in it is because of the Pynchon novel, Mason and Dixon, which I know you've mm. referred to in a footnote, which really pleased me because I think it's probably, it would make my top five novels of all time. I shamefully have not read it. Um, John, I think it's about eight hundred pages me. long or something. I know, but um, but as I understand it, it's quite, it gets a bit sort of magic realismy, doesn't it? Which I find uh, striking and and uh, quite a clever thing to do because, like, the Mason Dixon line is one of those lines that's kind of been imbued with this cultural power, where we it, we, we hear the name and we kind of imagine it's the border between the northern. United States and the Southern United States in the Civil War, you know, between the, the, the Union and the Confederacy. And it's not that at all. Uh, it's it's a much narrower line. That, can you have a narrow line? It's a much more narrowly defined line um, between Delaware and Pennsylvania on one side and Maryland on the other. It's about 400 miles of state boundary, which um, Mason and Dixon, a couple of English surveyors, were sent to survey to kind of settle 
uh, 80 years of land disputes in the, in the 18th century. Um, and that somehow their names get attached to the whole concept of like the border between between uh, between the Union and the Confederacy, even though it's nowhere near it. I just find it kind of fascinating how like there's a few of these that's got the signifiers kind of slip free of what they originally relate to. Yeah. And it's an amazing achievement, you know, scientifically, isn't it? You know, as to produce a straight line like that. Yeah. I mean, they did actually do the work. So, like, you know, you can still find um, uh, stones along the along the border to this day with like um, an M on one side and a P on the other to kind of mark which which state is which side. But, yeah, no, they did actually kind of like go to all the effort over several years of kind of surveying 400 miles of border which is why people actually knew where that border was meant to go, which they didn't necessarily know with, with a lot of straight lines you find elsewhere on the maps of the world. So, like, if you um, if you continue following the, the U.S. northern border to the west, for most of its length, it follows, I think it's the 49th parallel, but surveying technology was not not all it could have been. So, actually, it kind of, like, wobbles around it a little bit. As you say, it's such a significant cultural boundary I mean, there are books still being written about it. I mean, one written just the other month that we had in our magazine. And particularly with, I guess, the... Well, I don't want to venture too much into contemporary American politics, particularly if we're going to be dealing with Israel and Palestine. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, and I was going to talk about Northern Ireland, the partition of Ireland, and we'll ask you about it. So I'm dancing around here. Can we do the partition of Ireland then? Can we talk about that? Because I'm very interested in this. My family are from County Antrim. Ah, okay. So, so that's, that, that ended up in, the, in in Northern Ireland, didn't it, Antrim? Yeah, I think I, there was never going to be any doubt that Antrim would. But it's the border today. I don't know if you've travelled around the borderlands today. It's you, you're in the Republic one minute, and then you're back in uh, the United Kingdom the next. Yes, no, as I understand it, there are roads that do just kind of zip in and out. Um, which was like this this came up a lot during the, the sort of post brexit debate didn't it about how exactly like you could practically sort of bring that border back yes um, never mind the kind of political consequences there just like physically what could you do exactly exactly and uh, you know it, this is one of those because there are a few boundaries like that you write about and you know the partition of india as well which were borders that no one actually really wanted did you find many like that? Yes, I mean the part the, the partition of India is like one of the, is one of the stories I kind of found most int- uh, I, I I found most of the fascinating and devastating to research because it is it's one of those stories that nobody comes out well from. <laughs> My in- instinct as kind of you know liberal metropolitan you know guilt ridden Westerner um, was to kind of think it was all the fault of the British. You know a lot of it is. You know there's a lot you know the, the empire did include. A, you know, very deliberate divide and rule kind of like certain communities uh, apart from one or another and so on. But like, the, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of inter, inter sort of communal riots leading up to that period. And the division of India is basically, uh, the division of the what had been India was pushed for by by Muhammad Ali Jinnah, head of, head of the uh, All India Muslim League and the first Prime Minister of Pakistan, because, you know, he had watched what had happened in to, to uh, an ethnic and religious minority in Europe earlier in the same decade and was like, well, I do not want Muslims to be a minority in India. Um, so he wanted there to be kind of, you know, a safe state for India's Muslim community, which becomes Pakistan. Um, but also it didn't occur to him that, like, if you create this thing, people are going to have to move. Like, he was apparently shocked at quite how many millions of people end up getting on the road. But also, like, this, like you know, Britain announces that, you know, India is going to become independent as, as two separate countries before anybody has got around to kind of working out where this border is going to go. So in, in Punjab on, on one side of the country and Bengal on the other, like there are millions of people who literally do not know which, which country they're going to be in. Um, and when they finally announce the line, there's something, you know, it's basically ethnic cleansing. There's millions of people forced to move in either direction. It's a truly horrifying story that that's only just out of living memory, really. Yes, and obviously still living with the legacy today. And the mm. 
I mean, okay. So I've mentioned Israel Palestine. Let's let's go in now. Actually, the what I wanted to ask you about most was rather than the past, it was the future because there was a paragraph I think towards the end of that section that really interested me because you know in the wake of October the seventh, there've been a lot of discussion over one state, two state solutions here. But I think in the paragraph you write about what are potential solutions, you mention a confederation, and I hadn't heard about that, and I was very interested in that. So I should confess up front that this chapter was written before October the 7th um, and, and, and you know, hurriedly edited quite late in the process of getting the book out. So it does end on a slightly optimistic note that I'm, I'm no longer sure is, is how I would necessarily end it now. But yes, the idea of a, a sort of confederation, that's not something that like I, 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 I plucked out of the air or that you know the people I was writing about who proposed it had come up with recently. That is the the UN Minority Report from 1947, I think. You know, the UN produces two reports about the partition of what was then the Palestine Mandate uh, in, in terms of like how to kind of divide it up between between the Jewish and, and, and Arab communities there. And the, one of them was uh, basically create two, a two-state solution. I mean, we wouldn't call it a two-state solution, then, but it was basically like we will divide this into two countries, one for each community. But there was also a minority report which said, hey, well, like, given the sort of slightly odd distribution of, of land and the fact that these two these two territories are always going to be quite intertwined, wouldn't it make more sense to have something that looks a bit like basically Belgium? Um, so so you end up with, you know, two two largely self-governing communities that effectively function as as uh, as you know separate states in all sort of domestic policy but in terms of um what would have been like foreign defense i think like there will be kind of a confederation sat on top and that is the model you end up with in belgium it's not a million miles away from what the eu does now this was this was something that was seriously kind of considered in in the late 1940s but then events events rather overtook things uh, and there was a there was a war, and then you know Israel comes out of that, and so like it was, you know, it, it, it kind of sort of went. Uh, it was never really strongly on the table at that point. But there are people on on both sides of that divide who kind of talked about it more recently as like a potential solution in the kind of like having having kind of some shared institutions, but largely kind of you know separate communities. And you know this felt like a very a very nice uh, an optimistic note to end on. When I wrote the chapter, I'm not sure that feels terribly plausible right now, given October 7th and everything that's followed and then the horror show in, in Gaza. But it, it is also, it's just as difficult to see anything, see a two-state solution working at this point. So I, I, don't, I don't know what the future looks like, but it does feel like they can't go on like this. Yes, yes. But I think you're right. It does seem a little optimistic. OK, well, shifting on to, I, I think, a, a happier place of boundary confusion is Switzerland and Liechtenstein. Uh, this is a very amusing. I, so I, I spend a lot of time in Switzerland, actually, hiking. And I didn't know that Switzerland have been invading. Seems like it's sort of a, something that Switzerland does to Liechtenstein every ten years, and I didn't even know about this. Yes, no, it happens all the time. <laughs> the Swiss, the Swiss keep accidentally invading or bombing Liechtenstein. It's happened. How, how are they got a reputation for neutrality? I do not know. <laughs> so far as I can tell, it's like you know, Liechtenstein is obviously a very small. You know, it's, it's a microstate. It's 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 something like thirty thousand people. And, and basically like it's the size of an English borough or something. It's no, it's no space at all. And unsurprisingly, it's, it, it doesn't have a, 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 a militarised border with, with either of its neighbours, Switzerland or Austria. Um, so the border to Switzerland, the part of it is, I think, it's the very bottom of the River Rhine, possibly, or a different river. Um, I think there's, there's, there are some fairly sizable um, foothills of the Alps as well, which maybe divide. But for part of it, for, for at least 20 miles or something, it's fairly open land. You can kind of just nip in and out. Um, and the reason this is go, the, the, the things keep going horribly wrong is because Switzerland uh, has has conscription. <laughs> it has national service. So um, it happens on training exercises, basically. So like every, every few years, a bunch of Swiss teenagers are kind of lumbering about on their training manoeuvres, don't realise they've, they've crossed the border 
or on a couple of occasions don't realise quite where they're aiming their artillery and accidentally attack Liechtenstein. And the, the Liechtenstein government have been have been very good about this, it must be said. They've never attempted retaliation. Uh, they've never taken it to the UN. Um, but nonetheless, it seems to have happened uh, repeatedly over about 50 or 60 years. Yeah, it's, it's so funny. It's so uh, lovely to read about, you know, two neighbours that are, I guess happily forgiving and forgetting despite this happening so frequently it's uh mm -hmm. it's a model for many other nations i think right i think we're coming to the uh to the end of we're running out of time but i i wanted to talk about time zones because you've you've included time zones right at the end of the book and mm -hmm. there are some actually I haven't mentioned the Uyghurs at all in uh, any of the history we've been talking about on this podcast. I'm, I'm delighted that you've mentioned them, but in reference to time zones. So what's the relationship between the Uyghurs, time zones and, you know, the wider China? So, yes, China, um, China as, as, as listeners will no doubt know, is quite it's quite a big country. Um, actually, it's one of the one of the chapters I ended up uh, they ended up on the cutting room floor, which I uh, ran instead as a post on my newsletter was was about uh, empires that never fell um, we kind of think of China and Russia and to a certain extent the United States in fact as as you know nation states when you know territorially they are basically empires um, you know they conquered a bunch of territory and just kind of incorporated them into the into the metropole um, but you know, one 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 side effect of this in China is like it is a, it's a, it's you know two thousand miles wide or whatever it is. It's a stretch of territory that should logically, if you kind of did it rationally, it would probably stretch into five or six time zones. But since since the time of Chairman Mao, um, it has been uh, the policy of the the government in Beijing to keep the entire country on Beijing time. And you know, in in Xinjiang, in the in the far west where the Uyghurs are. That's a different two or three hours behind Beijing time rationally. So one of the many ways in which the kind of the 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 the, the minority population, the Uyghur population of the west of China, kind of rebel against the government, is is to set their watches to their to what they think should be the correct time zone. <laughs> um, and there are reports from from Human Rights Watch that you know people have literally been sent to camps for this, uh, which is which is horrifying. But they just kind of thought that was sort of an interesting form of, of rebellion. And, you know, this is, you know, time zones are as, as time zones are as political as anything else, really. Like, I think they're also examples of, of countries like Venezuela and North Korea uh, have both switched to different time zones at different points to kind of show that they are not, uh, they, they are not in the same time zone as their, as their, as their diplomatic enemies. <laughs> I just find it kind of fascinating that, Either you would think that time would be relatively apolitical, but no, not at all. Yeah, yeah. It's a lovely way to end the book, actually, and perhaps a subject for uh, your next one. And so I suppose uh, we've we've reached the end and we haven't even talked about Middlesex. We haven't. Um, why, I do, I do, were we going to talk about Middlesex? Well, we know we weren't. Happened. The reason why I, Middlesex doesn't really exist, does it? It doesn't, no. So actually, I gave you the... Um, where at the start of the show, I kind of gave you the kind of potted history of where the book came from. I actually totally ignored a bit, which is the embarrassing reason I have an interest in borders, which is that I grew up in a place which used to be Essex and is now in Greater London. And it was very, very important to me as a rather pretentious nerdy teenager that I wasn't really from Essex. I was from Greater London. Um, so like they so my interest in you know, Middlesex is a county that was completely abolished by the rise of Greater London. So, so my interest in, in Middlesex and what it stood for is, is a long-standing, yeah. Yeah, it's a, a, a county that I have a lot of affection for. And I, I suppose it was you who brought up the fact that it actually doesn't exist. So I have you to thank for that. Yes, um, no, the vast majority of it has been swallowed by Greater London. And I think there's a tiny bit that was now in Surrey. So, so may, maybe Middlesex should declare war on Surrey, like the, like the Liechtensteiners and the Swiss. Well, sports the replacement for war, so Middlesex will just have to beat Surrey at cricket. This has <laughs> been uh, this has been lovely, John. Thank you very much for your time. And the book is out hardback. It's available now. It's been out for a few months, actually, isn't it? Uh, it has. It came out at the end of April. Um, so it's, but it's it, yeah, it's it's available in all good bookshops and probably also some bad ones. Please, please do buy a copy. It's lovely.
Well, links to uh, one bad one is in the uh, show notes. <laughs> but uh, th- thanks very much, John. Thank you so much for having me. Good to talk to you. Thank you very much for listening. Coming up on Saturday, it's why we go to war with Richard Overy. But in the meantime, thank you and good night. Mm-hmm.